Hey there everyone, hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and continue with these recordings since we'll be playing a little bit of catch up on the 19th. Um, not for sure how far we'll get, so I thought I'd go ahead and record the next section of our unit on baptism. But, of course, we got to start off with some jokes. So here are some fun definitions of common words. Adult, a person who has stopped growing at both ends and is now growing in the middle. Beauty parlor, a place where women curl up and die. The different spelling of die, as in dyeing your hair. Chickens, the only animals you eat before they are born and after they are dead. Committee, adults, you'll probably appreciate this one more than the students. A body that keeps minutes and wastes hours. Dust, mud with the juice squeezed out of it. Handkerchief, I don't even know if kids, if you know what a handkerchief is. Uh, a handkerchief is defined as cold storage. Inflation, something that's in the news a lot these days. Cutting money in half without damaging the paper. Mosquito. An insect that makes you like flies better. We Minnesotans get that one. Raisin. A grape with a sunburn. Secret. Something you tell to only one person at a time. Tomorrow. One of the greatest labor-saving devices of today. <clears throat> and yawn, an honest opinion openly expressed. And a few more puns here for you. Two antennas met on a roof, fell in love, and got married. The ceremony wasn't much, but the reception was great. A jumper cable walks into a bar. The bartender says, I'll serve you, but don't start anything. Two peanuts walk into a bar and one was assaulted. A dyslexic man walked into a bra. And finally, a man walks into a bar with a slab of asphalt under his arm and says, a beer please, and one for the road. All right, let's jump into, uh, we're gonna do questions three and four in the worksheet uh, on the baptism unit. So we're going to be looking at the blessings of baptism. So what does baptism do for us? What does it give us? What does it deliver uh, to us? <clears throat> the power of baptism. The power of baptism is in God's word. We talk about this in terms of the how God created the universe with just the word and its power. So we know that God's word is active and living. It does things. It's powerful. So that word applied to us does something to us. Now it's joined with water. But as Luther will say, and you'll, you'll memorize this in the explanations, that the power is not in the word. Or I'm sorry, it's not in the water alone. But it's the word with in with in and with the water um, <clears throat> question B why do the scriptures call baptism the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit we kind of get this just naturally right um, if something is dirty what do you do you wash it that's how you make something clean and when we think about the filth of our sins um, how sins make us dirty and unpresentable. Um, we can kind of get this, this analogy, this correlation with water washing us. Uh, in baptism, we understand that the Holy Spirit works faith. So the Holy Spirit, when you are baptized, is doing something to you. And it is, it is granting you, it's giving you the gift of faith. Faith isn't something you do or decide. It's something that's given to you. So that's what the Holy Spirit works in you in your baptism. Now, unfortunately, <clears throat> reality says that we can choose to reject that faith. And I have seen people who have done that later in life, but we can never choose to get faith ourselves. It has to be a gift to us. 
And so this Holy Spirit, when it works faith in us, it creates in us a new spiritual life, right? Um, this faith gives us a trust, and in that trust we have life in Christ. And it also gives us the power to overcome sin. So this is why we as Christians understand that God is working in us and we strive to overcome those things, those sins that we struggle with in our life. And we understand that by the power of God, we can become less sinful. Um, we can't just always chalk it up to being human. We understand we'll never be perfect, but it's wrong to excuse our sinfulness uh, by just the fact that, uh, oh, we're, we're sinful human beings, that we understand that the Holy Spirit is actually working in us and we can overcome these sins. See, baptism works forgiveness of sins. Uh, Acts 22.16 says, and now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So, in baptism, we actually receive the forgiveness of sins. And that's something that we experience every day. Luther will talk a lot about each day. In our baptism, we die to sin and we rise to Christ. We are forgiven in our baptism each and every day, right? We all know that... Uh, nobody stops sinning the minute that they are baptized. D, in baptism, we are freed from sin, death, and the devil. They no longer control us. Uh, we've been freed from them. And we'll talk about this more, but this is why baptism because such, becomes such an important understanding and reality when somebody dies. Uh, why baptism is talked so much about in a Lutheran funeral service. Because we understand that because of our baptism, that death that we experience in this world um, <clears throat> isn't a permanent thing. It isn't an eternal thing. Um, this is actually a passage that is read um, responsively in a funeral, funeral service. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too, not my lids, may live a new life. So you can understand why this becomes so important um, in the context of a funeral or somebody's death. Um, baptism gives us eternal salvation. That's right, life forever in heaven. Uh, 1 Peter 3.21 says, And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Baptism saves us. Mark 16.16, 16, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe will be condemned. Um, so this brings up an interesting question. I think I'll go ahead and talk about it here. Um, and maybe uh, your family would encourage you to talk about this as a family. Oftentimes, so every time uh, we have a baptism, I meet with the family to talk about baptism and to talk about how the service will go. And one of the things I talk about is, is this passage in terms of the question always comes up, what if somebody dies without being baptized? Does that mean that if you're not baptized, you go straight to hell? And they'll use this verse uh, kind of to back up that question. But if you'll notice that the question doesn't say whoever is not baptized will be condemned. It says whoever does not believe. So we understand baptism to be an incredible gift that we would never turn down. Uh, and if we believe, we won't. Um, <clears throat> there are instances where somebody may die. I've, I've, had, I've had instances where uh, children die before they are able to be baptized. Maybe they even die before they're born. Um, we can't say that that child automatically goes to hell because they weren't baptized. Um, the bigger concern would be is if you were offered baptism and you refused it, because that would show a lack of faith. 
We also point to when Jesus died on the cross. Remember, he died between two thieves. Um, one of them, uh, clearly in their conversation with Jesus, one of them didn't believe who Jesus was and what he was doing. One of them actually confessed that Jesus is Lord. And we're fairly certain that that one who died believing in Jesus had not been baptized. Yet Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. So we look at baptism as a gift and as a sign of um, faith <clears throat> to the one desiring to be baptized or to the parents, um, something that we would never reject in faith uh, if we truly sought Jesus and salvation. Um, maybe we'll talk about it more. Talk about it as a family. Maybe you know of people who struggled with this, and we can talk more about it. Uh, F, in baptism we are given new life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And then G, in baptism, we put on Christ. I always talk about this in terms of the white baptismal gown you usually see little babies dressed in. We understand that to represent the perfection, the righteousness of Christ. So in baptism, that's what we're putting on. Uh, Paul writes in Galatians, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So that when, when we die and when God, Christ comes to judge us, we will be judged based off of the righteousness of Christ, not our own deeds. Okay, now these are just some reiterations of what we've talked about, just in kind of a little different visual form. If baptism connects me to Christ's death, Romans 6 talks about this, then it also connects me to his resurrection, a new life in him. One of the things that's important to understand about why, why water is used here is while water also, one side reminds us of and points us to the idea of washing, it also reminds us of death. We think of the death, those die who died in the flood. We think of Pharaoh and his army who died in the Red Sea. Um, and so with water can also come this idea of death and drowning. So that's another understanding of baptism, that in baptism, and it might visually make more sense if the person was immersed, dunked, um, but still the, the understanding is there, right? That in water we die. Um, but because we're connected to Jesus in baptism, we're connected to his death. And if we're connected to him in his death, then we're also connected with him in his resurrection. So if one who is baptized dies in the faith, we know that just as Jesus died and rose again, so this person will die and will rise again. If by baptism I have died with Christ, then my sinful self is destroyed, right? That's what dies, uh, what's drowned in our baptism. Uh, sorry, my phone just whistled at me there. Um, and I am freed from sin, right? I'm not bound to that sinful self anymore. I am freed from it. I'm freed from sin. In Christ, I have the power to not sin, to do that which is good. Since I know Christ rose from the dead, then I know that death no longer has power over me. Again, we've talked about this. Since the death he died was for all, and the life he lives is to God, then I can consider myself dead to sin and alive to God. Uh, finally, question four here. With which words do we regularly remember our baptism? And of course, this is um, something we say at the beginning of service. We call it the invocation. It's also a reminder that, going back to the Old Testament, this understanding that anything that is sinful cannot be in the presence of God. And if something sinful comes into the presence of God, it is destroyed. Then we understand that as we come to God in worship and we come into his presence, 
our baptism is very, very important. It allows us to come into his presence and to worship him uh, rather than being destroyed. Um, you'll see some churches, Catholic churches do this. I have uh, the, the sanctuary at the seminary where I went to school has a baptismal font um, in the narthex area right before you enter into the service and people are invited to dip their fingers in the water and make the sign of the cross. Again, this reminder that as I come into the presence of God, um, I'm forgiven. And so I can come uh, forgiven, new life in Christ, and worship him. So the words are in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They come from this command. <clears throat> Those are the first time uh, that for most of us, those words were ever spoken, were at our baptism. Um, and by repeating these words, we recall, we claim, and we confess before heaven, earth, and hell all that God, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has given us in our baptism. All right, there we go. Uh, gets us up to uh, question five, uh, and we will see you soon. Thanks.